today, church, I have entitled my message as What is your name? What is your name? Very interesting title. You know, when you first go to a new place, let's say you are a new student in university, you are a new student in school, maybe your first time coming to this church, the first question people will ask you is, Hello, what is your name? You will say, Hello, my name is... Fill in the blank. My name is Elisha. My name is Joshua. My name is Elijah. My name is Rina. So, name identifies a person. Correct? Name helps you to identify a... This person, the name is Celine. This person, the name is Elisha. So, it helps me identify a person. And... How many of you think that God knows your name? Every one of you think that God knows your name? Do you know that there is one occasion God didn't know your name? God asked someone in the Bible, what is your name? Today we're going to find out the revelation from this passage of scripture. It's from our soul. But then before we go into our soul, let me give you a background story of what happened. So, Abraham have a son. Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac have a son. The son's name is Jacob. Jacob have 12 sons. Of course, we know. And Rebekah have two sons, which is Esau and Jacob. So, it happens that one day, um, Esau went to hunt and he come back he was very very hungry he was very hungry and Jacob was cooking uh, soup and then Esau came back and said hey give me your soup and then uh, Jacob will say no I won't give you the soup you sell me your birthright then I'll give you this soup and then what he said? He said, what is this birthright? I'm dying now. I'm hungry. Give me the food. Take the, birth, birth, uh, the birthright. He don't want the birthright. And he gave his birthright to Jacob. Let us read the story from Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 to 34. It says, Esau sells his birthright. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from a field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with the same bread stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of the lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. What do you learn from here? You see, Esau was desperate. He wanted food. And he sell his birth right. It's like Jesus is the firstborn. And because of his desperateness of the things of this world, he said, what is this Jesus? Take la. That is how he treated his birth right. He did not keep his birth right when he was desperate, wanting the things to keep him alive. He let go of his birth right. And Jacob, get his birthright. And Jacob is actually the second son. Esau is the firstborn. Esau is supposed to get the blessing from Isaac. When Isaac was old, his eyes couldn't see anymore, was a bit blur. He wanted to bless Esau. One day, he called Esau and then he said, Esau, come here, come here. My firstborn, come here. I want to bless you today. Then he came and then he said, why not you make, cook me a soup also? 
And then he said, okay, I will go and hunt. So he went and hunt. And Rebecca, the mother of Jacob and Esau, heard, overheard the conversation between Esau and the father. And then Rebecca loved Jacob more. And then Rebecca said to Jacob, Hey, I heard that your mother, I heard that your father is going to bless Esau. I know what your father likes. I know what your father loves to eat. I know what to cook. You do as I say. Do as I say. So Jacob said, How can it be? I'm such a smooth, smooth-skinned person. Esau is such a hairy person. When my father come and touch me, of course he will know that I am Jacob. And instead of getting his blessing, I may get his curse, he said. And then Rebecca said, no, it's okay. If your father is going to curse, let him curse me. Let the curse be upon me. You do as what I say. And there is a lot of spiritual meaning in this, but we're not going to go into that. But we're going to see what happened after that. After that, Isaac, because um, Rebecca was telling Jacob that you should do this, you should take the, the skin of the animal and then put on your put put on you, and then when your father touch you, it's hairy, right? Then your father will think that you are Esau. Are you my firstborn? And then Jacob will say, yes, I'm your firstborn. And then Isaac will bless Jacob instead of Esau. What happened after that, right, is Jacob was running away from his life because Esau wanted to kill him. Because Jacob has stolen the blessing from Esau. So, Esau hated Jacob so much. So Esau wanted to kill Jacob. So Jacob was running for his life. And it came to pass that he came to this place and he was alone. This Genesis chapter 32, verse 22 to 32. Let us read together. Huh? Wrestling with God. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabok. He took them and sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, capital M, which is the angel of the Lord, which represents God, a man wrestled with him until the day, until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. God blessed Jacob there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. So, in this story, we can see that the title of today's message is actually taken from this story where God asked him, what is your name? What is your name? Today, we're going to discover about that. But before that, I just want to share a few things. Is that, you know, in the Bible, whenever something happened, whenever they do something to remember of that incident, they will name the name of the place as the specific word. Let us see, uh, even in this chapter itself, Genesis chapter 32, it also have two places that Jacob named the place based on the thing that happened. 
in Genesis 32, verse 2, uh, it says, When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's army. So he named that place Mahanaim, two armies, which means two armies. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means the face of God, because he saw the face of God. He saw God face to face, and his life was spared and not snatched away. So we can see that in this story, Jacob named the name of the place with a name to identify this is the place that this specific thing happened. Even in Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, and the people grumbled and deplored their hardship, which was evil in the ears of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and devoured those in the outlaying parts of the camp. The people cried to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire subsided. He called the name of the place Tabera, which means burning, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. So, in this story, we can see that Moses named the place as Tabera, which means burning, for them to remember that because they grumble, that's why God burned the place and they called the name Tabera to remember that incident. There is another incident also in Numbers 21. It says, When the Canaanite king of Arad, who dwelt in south, the Neged, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atarim, the route traveled by the spies sent out by Moses, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver these people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their city. And the Lord hearkened to Israel and gave over the Canaanite, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And the name of the place was called Horma, which means a band or devoted things. So you can see this meaning, right? When you read in the Amplified Version, when the, you read in the Amplified Version, it will expand to you what is the meaning of that word. If you just read it in NKJV and IV, it will just merely tell you that the name is called Horma. The name is called this. The name is called that. So it doesn't tell you the meaning of the word. But if you read the Amplified, it will tell you what is the specific meaning of that word. And even in Naomi's life, you know, last week, uh, our main service, we learned about Ruth and Naomi, right? And when Naomi went out from Bethlehem to, to the city, to the other city, she was full. She got her husband, she got her children. But then when she came back to Bethlehem, where she left, she was empty. And then she changed her name also. And she said this, and she said to them, call me not Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Because something happened to her. She lost her sons, she lost her husband. So it's like not very nice thing to happen to a person. Lah. So she changed her name. So we can see that through this, name actually carries meaning. Name carries meaning, right? And even in the life of Abraham, Abraham's name was Abraham, right? And God changed his name to Abraham, correct? So we see this, nor shall your name any longer be Abraham, which means High, exalted father. But your name shall be Abraham, the father of a multitude. For I have made you the father of many nations. So we can see that throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, name always carry meaning. So that's why it's very interesting. Today, title message is, what is your name? 
What is your name? And we can see even in the New Testament, also a lot of people change their name. Ser Sarai, the name was changed to Sarah. Simon, the name was changed to Cephas or Peter. Saul, the name is changed to Paul. And Jacob, name is changed to Israel. And today we're going to focus on this last one, which is Jacob to Israel. Just like how I asked you all just now, how many of you think that God knows your name? God knows our name, right? The Bible says that God knows our name. God knows the number of our hair. God knows everything about us. God knows us before we are born. God knows every single thing about us. But what happened here? Why suddenly God forget someone's name? Why suddenly God asked Jacob, what is your name? You know, when God called Moses, he called Moses, Moses, Moses. When he called Samuel, he called him by name, Samuel, Samuel. When he met Saul, he called him, Saul, Saul. What happened here? Why God suddenly forget this person's name? Jacob. Why God forget Jacob's name? Let us go back to our main scripture. We will focus only on these verses. Pay attention. Huh? This is what God said. So he said to him, God said to Jacob, what is your name? And then he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And this is the version, New King James Version. When you read New King James Version, it will just tell you, my name means Jacob. But what is God teaching here? Let us read in Amplified, then I will explain to you. In Amplified, it says, the man, which is capital M, God, asked him, what is your name? And in shock of realization, whispering, he said, Jacob, which means supplanter, schemer, trickster, swindler. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, supplanter, but Israel, contender with God. For you have contended and have power with God and with men and have prevailed. What God is saying here is, God wants the word to come out from you. God knows you are a sinner. But He wants you to admit that you are a sinner that cannot help yourself. You know, Jacob, he was a cheater. Just now we read in Genesis 25, he stole the birthright of Esau. Esau is supposed to be the firstborn. But because of Esau's desperate situation, Jacob took the advantage and asked him to sell his birthright and he cheated Esau. His supplanter means cheater, liar. He's a liar. God knows all of us. He knows every single detail of us. But to be safe, we have to admit before God, God, I am a sinner. I need you. Only a doctor, only a sick person needs a doctor. A healthy person doesn't need a doctor. A healthy person, I don't see a healthy person walk to the hospital and ask the, the doctor to check me, check me. No, they don't. Because they are healthy. But a sick person know how to seek God. You know, Jacob was so desperate. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's the attitude that we should have. I will not let you go until you give me this gospel. I will not let you go until you reveal to me the revelation of the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of God's righteousness. His baptism 
death and resurrection that has saved you so beautifully, if you still have not understood this, come like Jacob. When God asks you, what is your name? Tell God, God, this is my identity. My identity without you, I am a sinner. I'm a sick person. I am someone who deserves to die because of the sin that I commit. I don't deserve to live eternally, but I believe in your righteous work. I believe in the baptism of Jesus. Where John the Baptist lay his hand, that is where all my lifetime of sin will pass unto Jesus. And when he walked three years, I walked with him. And when he died, I died with him. When he resurrected again, I have a new life to live. Can you believe that or not? That is all that God wants you to believe. God knows what? God knows everything about us. He don't need anything from you. He just wants you to come to your realization that you cannot save yourself. He wants to save you. But He first wants to ask you, what is your name? Are you a righteous person in yourself? Or are you a sinner in yourself? Apart from Christ, none of us are righteous. We have to come to this place. Just like Jacob, he admitted that my name is Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, schemers, trickers, swindlers, a liar, a cheater. Can we come to a place, humble ourselves and say that, God, apart from you, I'm nothing. That is the change of identity. But how does that relate to this man? Focus. For us to know the manifold grace of God, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold revelation of God, first we need to know our identity. We need to know our identity. Or else, Satan will come and lie to you and say that you are not good, you are not great, you are not a righteous person, you are a sinner, you are still Jacob. But didn't God change his name to Israel? The contender? Someone who prevailed? Today, God has changed your name. Your name is no longer Jacob. You are no longer a sinner. You are a righteous child of God. But at times, we will still remember our old name. Because why? Because we have that name since we are born. We are born as a sinner, right? Today, let's say, I said, okay, Elijah, I changed your name to Daniel. From today onward, I will call you Daniel. So whenever I call Daniel, it's not Elijah looking at me. Daniel will look at me. Because Daniel is Daniel's name. That is your new name. Correct? So we have to get used to our new identity. Does it take time? It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Today, I'm sinless and righteous. And I'm always sinless and righteous. When thing hits us, when something happened, when our friend betrayed us, when family issue, is our identity still firm that I'm a child of God? I'm sinless and righteous. I'm Israel. I'm no longer Jacob. Yes, I used to be Jacob, but because I admitted that I'm Jacob, I'm a supplanter, I'm a cheater, I'm, I have nothing good in me, that's why God changed my name. God knows what? God knows my name is Jacob. Why He need to ask me what's my name? He just want that word to come out from you. He want that word to come out from your mouth to admit that you are a sinner that cannot save yourself. That's all He need. He don't need anything from you. You know, the first thing that we need to tell someone when you preach the gospel is, you are a sinner. It will be hard to do because no one likes to be told that they are a sinner. But that is the criteria because only a sick person needs a doctor. If someone is so healthy, for what? Jesus for what? Jesus has no role in your life. That's why the first thing is to tell them that you are a sinner. When you know that you are a sinner and you have been made righteous, then you will appreciate your righteousness. The righteousness that God has given to you. Because you know how bad you are. 
you know that apart from Christ, you have nothing good. And because you know that, the righteousness of God becomes so valuable to you. The righteousness of God becomes everything to you because you know how sinful you are. Because you know that, wow, I'm such a dirty person. Ah. This kind of thing also I can do. Ah. Of course you can do. In our flesh, even after we are born again, we can still do what the people of the world do when we don't walk in the Spirit. That's why walking in the Spirit is so important. Reminding ourselves again and again, our identity. If we forget our identity, then we cannot experience the manifold grace of God, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold revelation of God, the manifold mercies of God, the manifold words of God. Because Satan has lied to us. Your name is still Elijah. Your name has not changed. Satan can still lie to Jacob. Your name is not Israel. Your name is Jacob. You are still a cheater. You are still a liar. God wants us to have this new identity. When we have this new identity in Christ, then we can reign with Him. We are in the quarter of reign. We can only reign with Christ when we know our, our identity. When we know our identity, we can reign with Christ. Who are you in Christ? I showed this slide to Lifeline before. Who are you in Christ? Do you know who you are in Christ? Who are you in Christ? Are you still a sinner that deserves hell? Are you still a cheater? Are you still Jacob? Or is your name changed to Israel? Has God blessed you? You know, Jacob was so desperate. He said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's the attitude that we should have towards God. God, I want to preach this gospel to my friend. Help me. Use me as a vessel to spread this gospel. Are you desperate enough and tell God, God, I will not let you go until you make this happen. People are dying every single day. What are we doing about it? Are we so selfish that we have the medicine, we have the answer, but not sharing it? We have to start sharing this gospel. If you know that this is a true gospel, the gospel of God's righteousness, which considered Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, if you know that this is the true gospel, you will go all out, all out, to spread this gospel. Because you know, if people do not have this gospel, they cannot get saved. If you really, really believe. That's why for us, to live is Christ. No longer we who live. The Bible says in Colossians, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Today we are born again, we know the gospel of God's righteousness. We have been raised, the Bible says. We have been raised with Christ. It's no longer we who live. Christ living in us. And because we have the spirit of Christ living in us, we can share the gospel. You just have to desire and say, God, unless you give me the opportunity, I can never, give, I can never spread the gospel. You, use me. Use me greatly for your glory. Just have that desire. You will see that God will open the door. Some mind-blown ways, He will open up the door for you to spread the gospel. Are you desperate enough like Jacob and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. We have to have that same attitude. We have to first know that we, in our flesh, we can never do that. We can never spread the gospel in our flesh. Flesh beget flesh, but spirit beget spirit. Let the spirit of God that is in you do the work. You just walk in your spirit. 
just whenever you sin, whenever you feel that you are a sinner, whenever you, Satan condemn you, Satan lie to you, tell him, you are supposed to be under my feet. Why are you fighting with me here? You don't deserve my mind. You don't deserve my heart. You're supposed to be there. Tell Satan that, go back to your place. Know your identity. When you know your identity, you can do that. If you don't know your identity, is still so shaky. Maybe. Today I'm sinner. Tomorrow I'm righteous. Tomorrow I'm sinner. Today I'm righteous. It won't work. God cannot use this kind of person. Double-minded. Like a wave. God cannot use. Because even if you can preach the gospel to someone, you cannot keep sharing and making them grow. Because... Preaching this gospel is not one time I preach the gospel, you believe, and then you are safe. Forever you are safe. You need mentoring. If you yourself are not stable, how can you mentor someone? That's why meditation, maturity, then you mentor. Then only you can experience the manifold grace of God, manifestation, magnify. Then we can reign with Christ. This is the theme for this year. Are we in this? Throughout the months, how many months pass by? This is the 10th month. Where are we today? Are we fulfilling that theme in our life? Are we starting to reign with Christ today? Or are we still the same person last year, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? Or have we changed? Has God transformed you from Jacob to Israel? That's all. That's all that God wants. When you died, God can use you. Today, a bite wall is taken from Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So you see, the Bible says that we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. Today, our identity is no longer our own identity. Our identity is hidden with Christ in God. That's why uniting with Christ is so important. Uniting with Jesus through His baptism, know that all your lifetime of sin will pass unto Jesus. All that you are has been passed upon the body of Jesus. All that you are. This is you you enter into Christ. That's why your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Jesus walked three years, you walked three years. When He rose again, you rose again. That's why the verse just now we saw started with, you have been raised with Christ. It's only when we are united with Jesus through His baptism, we can rise up with Him. When we rise up with Him, we have a new life to live. We have a new identity. We have the new identity. That's the first thing that we discover. Identity. After I know my identity, let's say you are a son of the king. You are the son of the king and you know your identity that you are the son of the king. But another thing you need to find out, what is your inheritance? What is your inheritance? What did God promise to you? What you have in Christ? Today, now I know, yes, I'm sinless and righteous. Yes, I'm a child of God. Yes, I, I, I have all in Christ. But what is that all that you have in Christ? The inheritance. If I am the son of the king, the daughter of the king, what the king has belongs to me, correct? So today, we are united with Jesus through his baptism. We die with him. We rose again. What Christ has is for us. But what is that? Today, for us to enjoy reigning with Christ, we need to know what is the inheritance that God has given to us. What is the promises that God has given to us? What is the the thing, whatever that the Bible say, what did God say about you uniting with Christ? 
what you have after uniting with Christ. What's, what's your inheritance? The Bible say, for all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So, we know that all the promises of God is yes and amen. We know. Right? After knowing what? What is that that is yes? What is that promise? God said that I will never leave you. God said that I will never forsake you. God said that I will always be with you. God said that I will give you wisdom. God said that I will give you healing. God say so many things in the Bible. Have we discovered what God say about us? Knowing that is very important. Because if we don't know, then it's just like a king, child, living like a beggar. We have all the promises of God. We have all the wisdom of God. We have all the grace of God. We have all the revelation of God. But we are behaving worse than the people of the world. When things hit us, we get worried as if God cannot take care of you. As if there is no more tomorrow. Because we don't believe that this God can do something. Because we don't believe that God is in control. Do you know what God has done for you? What God has promised you? Today, go back home, discover what is these promises that God has given to you. The inheritance that He has given to you. What's inheritance? Inheritance is basically what your parents pass to you. As a child, your, your parents got three child, right? Whatever that your parents have, then whatever that your parents have belongs to you. Now you are a child, you still don't know. When they move on to the next life, when they go back to heaven, whatever that they have belongs to you because you are the child. Today, because we are united with Jesus, the Bible says in Romans, we are co-heirs with Christ. The Spirit Himself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then as, as of God and join as with Christ. Some translations say, call as with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So today, because we are united with Jesus, we die with Him, we rose to life with Him, we are called as with Christ. What is as? It's basically the child. So today, because we are united with Jesus, we have the spirit of sonship. That's why when we pray, we pray to the Father, which is very important. I emphasize this also. Some of you, I also call some of you, pray to the Father. This is very important because the spirit of sonship is in you. If the spirit of sonship is in you, you don't pray, Lord, Father, God, God, Father. No, you pray to the Father in Jesus' name. This is a very powerful prayer because we have the sonship. We are co-heirs with Christ. Whatever that belongs to Christ, belongs to us. We are called as with Christ. Amen? And if you want, today, when you go back, read Ephesians, you will discover the inheritance that you have in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, let us read together. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 to 19, it says, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of His glory. In Him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased 
possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is the prayer of Paul to the Ephesian church, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the sin, and what is the exceedingly greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the work of His mighty power. So this is the prayer of Paul to the Ephesian church. He said, I pray that God will give you the wisdom and revelation. Let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know the hope of His calling, the riches of the glory, pay attention to this, of His inheritance in the saints. In the saints. Not in the sinner. If you are still a sinner, you cannot claim this inheritance. It's just like your neighbor's child come to your father and say, give me, give me all the money, give me all your money. No, the money doesn't belong to your neighbor's child. The money belongs to your parent's child, which is you. But do you know what belongs to you? But do you know what is the inheritance that you have? Sometimes we so desperately want thing, something from our parents. I want new phone, I want new car, I want new house. Why not we claim from our Heavenly Father first? God, you said that your manifold wisdom is for me. I pray that I will release that wisdom so that through my life, people will see you. Your name will be glorified through me. Will and always want to live in the Spirit. When you live in the Spirit, when you let God rule over you, when you let God work through you, then you will see all these promises come to pass in your life. Our identity. So today, if I ask you, what is your name? Do you have a new name in Christ? Or are you still holding on to your old name? My name is still Earn. Or I have a new name in Christ. That is what you all have to discover. Amen?